Good morning, viewers. It's a new day. Welcome to today's devotion with the Daily Fountain, the devotional guide of the Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion. Invite your family and friends. Get your Bible and your Daily Fountain manual while our devotional leader takes us on today's devotion. Good morning, dear viewers. We thank you for joining us for yet another time to study God's Word through our Daily Fountain. It is our prayer that God will minister His Word, will minister life, will minister power to us in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we praise you for yet another time in your presence to look into your Word. We pray, mighty God, that you bless us, you enrich us, you strengthen us, you encourage us. We pray, Lord, that your Word will be a strong motivation and when we're feeling down, when we're feeling low, through your grace, Lord, we shall receive new strength and power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, good morning, and we thank you for joining us. Today, uh, being Monday, 20th of April, we are looking at the text, 1 Peter chapter 1, from verse 10 to 16. 1 Peter chapter 1, from verse 10 to 16. And the topic says, Be holy, for I am holy. Let's read our text. It says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that you have now, been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, we see Peter writing to churches. is what we call a general epistle. He's not writing to a specific church. He's writing to Christians all over. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and so on. So you see clearly that he's not just writing to one congregation, he's writing to several people wherever they are, as they are scattered all over the place. Because you know persecution in the early days uh, we had to scatter the Christians, even the apostles. They went to different areas to minister the word of God. So Peter, still being an apostle, uh, had to write to them to encourage them, um, to help them understand that Jesus Christ is still their living hope. They should not lose sight of that, that the resurrection is still uh, very meaningful and still has effect even for those ones who believe. Especially at this point, you know that even Paul, have been ministering to Gentile nations. So it's very possible that he's also writing to people who had no uh, previous knowledge of what it means to, be, um, to, to know God and to have a relationship with God. And now they're talking about Jesus Christ. So he had to preach to them to help them understand this new faith that they were experiencing. But you see that Peter didn't just absolve them of, well, since you don't know what it means, just live your life anyhow. Because if, if you go through some of the epistles of Paul, you see that he has been preaching grace. The grace of God, uh, yes, we are saved by grace. He talks about uh, our relationship with God, everything working out by grace. If you have faith, you can be saved, you know. Uh, so he has been emphasizing so much on the grace of God made available to all those who believe. But now, Peter, trying to put a balance to this, help them understand that as, as far as you have been saved by the grace of God, God doesn't just allow His grace to be taken for granted. 
That is why Paul said it clearly in Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Do we continue to sin in order that the grace of God may abound? And he said no. The grace of God has been made available to us, but the grace of God has also enlightened us. It has, opened, it has also opened our eyes to realize how far we are fallen and what we should now do. This preaching on holiness and being holy is not so popular in our days because people tend to look just at the grace of God. Yes, the grace of God is powerful. The grace of God is effective. The grace of God has saved us. But the grace, that same grace has put us on a standard. It has put us on a level. It has taken us from where we were to where we should be. So there's something that God desires for us to do. He's not just saying that, well, you can do whatever it is you want to do. Yes, you are living a life of freedom, but your freedom is within Christ. We have not been called to liberty to now take your liberty for granted. The fact that you are the son of your father or you're the daughter of your father, your parents, uh, doesn't mean you live your life anyhow. Yes, you might fall asleep. Maybe, let's say, within a household, you're free to stay in any part, any room. You can be in the kitchen. You can be in the living room. You can even enter your parents' room. You can go anywhere in the house that you want. And say, yes, this house belongs to us. But it doesn't mean that you now take your food from the kitchen to now go into the toilet to eat. You know that you have freedom to do that. But it doesn't make sense for you to not do that. You should not take that grace for granted. You know? So when it comes also to our Christian living, the fact that God has given us liberty, the fact that he has given us freedom, the fact that his grace is so great, it abounds, it is mighty, it is powerful, doesn't mean we should not take that grace for granted to say that, no, we have nothing to do with holiness. It says very clearly in that first Peter uh, that we just read, in verse 14, it says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. God can overlook your former ignorance. He can say, well, you didn't know. But now that you have been saved, now that you're a child of God, he expects something from you. You know, many years ago, when I was still in the seminary, you know, someone who felt he, 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 he was a sinner. You know, we are all sinners, but this one he felt he was a sinner. So let's keep living our lives of sin. And for those of us or other people who felt, well, these ones, they are the holy ones. They are the, they are the prayer warriors. He felt, ah, these ones, you're, you're only pretending. You're only being pretentious. Now he said, well, Jesus Christ came to die for people like us who are sinners. But I said to such a person that, well, the first time Jesus Christ came, yes, he came to die for sinners. But the second time that he will come, he's not coming for sinners. He's coming for those ones who have lived the life that God expects of them. So you shouldn't just live in your former ignorance to say, well, if God so loved us before, even now as we continue in our sin, God will still love us. God expects something from you. He doesn't expect you to still live in that former ignorance. He expects you to be transformed. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus 19, he says, be holy. And also in the New Testament, he repeats it, be holy. It is a fulfillment of scripture. Don't say that it's only God that can be holy. Oh, it's only Jesus Christ that can be holy. Jesus Christ lived a life of sin. That is him. Do you know the temptations I'm facing? Do you know the trials I'm going through? Do you know what I, what I experienced in my life? That is why. You know, we always use this excuse, I'm only human. God understands. Yes, God understands, but be prepared for the consequences. He expects something better from you. He expects you to make a better decision. He expects you to come to him for help. You have been saved so that you can also be a help to other people, not to keep living in your former lifestyle. Holiness is a prerequisite as a child of God. We can also say that, well, since we cannot be perfect, doesn't mean that we should not even try at all. God expects us to still try to live a life better than the kind of life we're living before. Because we have tried that one and it did not help us. We have lived a life of sin, it did not help us. We suffered many consequences, we lived in many grave errors. Sometimes the mistakes of your past will always meet up with you tomorrow. But the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God takes us to a new platform, brings us into a new family. He expects us to live better. We are also not taking for granted the fact that you might make mistakes. You might fall short. But don't remain in that place and say, well, since we cannot try, since we cannot live up to that standard, let's just forget about it. No, God expects you to at least make an effort. Try. Study his word. Pray. 
if you're about to make a, a grave mistake, say a short prayer, Lord, help me. And at that moment, I tell you, God finds a way to help his people. Don't say holiness is only for the ministers of God, it's for the pastors, it's for those ones who are close to the altar. The holiness is demanded even for the lowest person, even for children, holiness is demanded of you. It is not something that you are, I mean, it's not something that you do that makes you holy. It is who we are. As children of God, we are called to be holy. But as you make decisions every day for small things in your, in your household, for big things out there, maybe in government, in politics, in, in your place of work, God expects us to, hold, to be holy, to make right decisions that shows that we are set apart. Because that is what holiness means. Holiness means being set apart, being consecrated. That this thing may have been used for something bad before, but now we use it for something good. You who has been set apart, you used to do bad things before, you now separate yourself from such evil things. Yes, all around us there is so much evil and it's very hard. Temptations are always there. But God made it very clear that Jesus Christ was a like man like us. He had like passions like us. He had the same lusts and weaknesses that we experience. But he lived above it and he expects us to also do the same. It is our prayer that in any point where we feel weak, in any point where we feel confused, that the grace of God will minister life to us and will make better decisions that will show that truly we are trying to live a holy life. Let's go through our devotional this morning. It says, in the last few days, we have discussed the resurrection of Christ from the dead and its implications to the believer. For us to benefit fully from it, and experience its power here on earth, we must be holy. We must be set apart. We must be consecrated. We must be determined to live the life that God expects of us. God is holy and has commanded us to be holy. It is a command. It's not even uh, just a plea. It's a command for us to be holy. It means being separated from impurity and set apart for God and his use. God can use any person. It is not your own works of righteousness that will make God use you. It is your availability. God can use you more than he uses a Jew or uses a pastor. Yes, they might be doing their own vocation, but even your own little corner, you might be able to reach more people than what other, uh, other priests or, or, or pastors are reaching. You might have a better opportunity to reach somebody who is in a marketplace Reach somebody in your office. Reach somebody who is poor, who is forgotten, who is downtrodden. God expects of us to live a better life. And he is ready to use us if only we make ourselves available. Look through the scripture. Many times the people that God uses are not the great and mighty people. He uses the low. He uses the poor. He uses those ones who are forgotten. But when they make themselves available to, the, to him, he empowers them for the work that he calls them to do. Though... Not much is being preached about it these days. It is Im its importance to the church cannot be overemphasized. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, we cannot see God. Now, it is not your holiness as we said before. It is the holiness of Christ as long as we accept it and we build up on that. Now, in verse 10 to 12 of our text, the prophets of the Old Testament spoke about the salvation that would come through Christ and the glory that would follow his suffering. They did not only speak about them, but also searched and longed for their own time of manifestation. However, the prophecy was not for them. The Old Testament, they were looking for such a time when the Spirit of God will be poured out upon all flesh, when the Spirit of God will be made manifest to them that the life they were struggling to live before, they can now live effortlessly. That life is what is made available to us. What they were struggling for, we, have, we now have it easily as long as we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now, going on from there, it says, We are therefore privileged to have it in our own time with its full rights and benefits. These full rights and benefits are conditional, however. They are conditional. It says, Any intending partaker must put away the old life of lust and immorality being an obedient child of God, and maintain a steady life of holiness. Now, as we said earlier, it is not that we are all called to be perfect. Yes, we are called to be perfect, but we may not be perfect. But at least we'll tread 
we will walk, we will strive towards that perfection. Even Paul himself made it. He says, I have not attained it, but I walk daily. I walk to attain it. Anyone who must follow Christ must carry up his cross daily and follow him. Deny yourself. Deny yourself those pleasures. Deny yourself those so-called evil opportunities. Say, well, everybody else is doing it. You know, that is one very pathetic situation that we find ourselves now. That corruption and evil seems to be a normal thing. Now, if you're not doing it, you seem to be an odd person. But it shouldn't be so. Being good, being truthful, searching for justice shouldn't be a negative thing. It's actually a good thing. So wherever it is that you are, speak the truth. Live a life of a person who knows that Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior. We say that Jesus Christ is our Savior, but we don't seem to express that he's our Lord. When he's your Lord, he's in charge of everything over our lives, every decision that we want to take. So never take that for granted to say, well, it is my life. I will live it the way I want to live. No, it's no longer your life. You have been bought with a price. Jesus Christ died for us that we may live for him. So if you're anticipating this new life, be sure that you are living your life now for him. And his glory will be made manifest in our lives in Jesus' name. Now it says, are you ready to do so? Remember that no man shall, shall, shall see God without peace or holiness. No man shall experience God without this holiness. And this holiness, you need to take note, is a decision. You have to make that conscious decision now to say, well, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Savior. It is not my own righteousness. It is not my own holiness, but the righteousness and holiness that Jesus Christ has imputed into my own life. I will try to make my own decisions. I will try to do things, be separate from all worldly lust. The Bible tells us, there are three major things you need to take care of. Your eyes, the loss of the eyes, the loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. If you take note of these things, that what you see can easily lead us into temptation. So be careful that you don't look too much at evil things. Because before you know it, those pictures are already entering your head and you're already thinking about it. It is not thinking about evil things that is the sin per se. It is when you take action upon those things that the sin comes up. If you look at Quick, very quickly, look at James. You see that James puts it very clearly for us uh, in James chapter 1. It says, uh, James chapter 1 from verse 13. Or let's even say from verse 14. It says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So yes, the thought, by seeing something, the picture enters our head and we say, ah, let me do this. You see the money, you see the opportunity, you see the, the, the avenue for you to backbite against somebody. Say, ah, you, take, you, you, you make use of it, you now go into action. Before you know it, that thing now becomes your way of life. Be careful because the devil will always be there to tempt us, to lure us, to entice us. If the thought comes into your head to do an evil or to say an evil, then you need to reject it immediately. Say, devil, I recognize your work and I rebuke you in Jesus' name. By the time you rebuke him, one time, two times, you see that it now becomes your own lifestyle that you don't easily fall into temptation. Some other people will say, well, you might just fall into it. You don't know when these things will just happen. No, it's the decision that you take that lands us into trouble. If you find yourself in despair tomorrow, in depression tomorrow, you have taken certain decisions that landed you there. Somebody else who is joyful, somebody else who is experiencing the, the, the strength of God, the peace of God, is because they made a decision to live that life. Make a decision to be holy. Make a decision to follow Christ. And we pray that the spirit of holiness will be imparted into our lives in Jesus' name. Our prayer today is, Lord, cause me to be sensitive of holy living every time. Cause me to be sensitive of holy living every time. It is a prayer that... We shall be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit because He's there, already available. As long as you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is already in you, working you in you good thoughts, good actions, good things that you should do. But we seem to reject Him many times. Be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And as He leads you day by day, you see that joy and peace will always be our portion and to overflow in our lives in Jesus' name. Let us pray. 
Lord our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning, reminding us to be holy even as you are holy. We know, God, we are falling short of your glory. We know, God, we are far from perfection. But your grace has been made available to us. Help us to walk daily. Help us to be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit. Help us to live the life that will glorify your holy name. So on the day that you shall call us home, none of us will be found wanting. None of us shall be lost. None of us shall be in despair. But instead, you shall call us your own beloved children. This we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, viewers, for joining us again. We pray that as we go about our daily activities, the Lord of holiness will lead us in the path of righteousness, will lead us in the path of holiness, and his name be glorified in our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you and God bless you. We thank you for fellowshipping with us today. We invite you to join us tomorrow morning, same time, same station, for another special edition of the Daily Fountain. If you are led to sponsor or support this program, please contact the numbers and email all showing on your screen.